Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> if you want to look with me at the scripture that we want to look at today, it's found in Matthew chapter 2, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1. And um, Matthew and Luke have the Christmas story, if you want to call that, the birth of Jesus. And only Matthew has this particular um, event, that's the event of the wise men. <clears throat> We've been looking during this Advent season, the four Sundays that lead up to Chris, uh, Christmas Day, <clears throat> at the involvement of humans, uh, how God incorporated us into this rescue mission for us used us as heralds of his coming, as vehicles, and as illustrations of what he came to do. The wise men, we heard, if you, if you discerned it on the informative video, um, there were not necessarily three. We just come up with the tradition that there are three wise men because there are three different gifts that were given, but that does we don't know how many there were. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot about them that we don't know. <clears throat> we don't know where they came from, for sure. We think that they were from probably Arabia. They were possibly aware of the whole idea of a Messiah from descendants of Ishmael, the son of Abraham. Abraham, of course, knew that there was, in some sense, he knew that there was to come a Messiah, and it would come through him and through his son Isaac, not through Ishmael, his other son. Some believe that that could be where they had the notion of a Messiah. Others believe and I think it's easy to understand this one too, that the scattering of the Jews in <clears throat> several captivities and sacking of Jerusalem and defeat of the nation of Israel would have gotten them in contact with the notion of a king of Judah, a king of the Jews. <clears throat> we don't know. <clears throat> they were called magi because they were involved they were a class of scholars and probably noblemen to some degree who spent their time studying the heavens they were astronomers they were natural scientists they looked looked at science and studied that they would have been considered then um astronomers in our day <clears throat> And I did have this quick thought reading it. Here's a place where the false war of scientific learning and faith in Christ is shown to be false. These men were highly educated in the science of their day, studied the stars, and when it comes to astronomy, the people of this day um, we've only somewhat improved on the basics that they discovered um, spending nights studying the heavens. They were men of learning who loved God. It is possible. Um, you don't have to choose which one you're going to be. These men were both. <clears throat> we know that they got to Jerusalem but the only thing we're somewhat certain of, <clears throat> they arrived in Jerusalem in the final year, the first year of Jesus' birth, and the final year of Herod's reign, final year of his life. The kids, by the way, in the video, I think, said the wise men were there at the stable in Bethlehem, but that, that is incorrect. They were, prob they, they were in a house, and this was subsequent to Jesus' birth. So the, the teachers on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights have got to get, they got to get going here. Um, <clears throat> they're leading their kids astray. Um, 
There's a message, though, that I want us to look at from this visit by the wise men. <clears throat> and we'll read the passage first and then look at what we learn from them and what this illustrates. In verse 1, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophets. <clears throat> this is from the Old Testament prophet Micah. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them, until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they, thought they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. The scripture goes on, records that nearly that very night, or maybe the next night, an angel warned Joseph to flee into Egypt, and Joseph and Mary got up that night, while it was still that night, and fled in the middle of the night to Egypt, because Herod then, discovering that the wise men had not gone back, and told him what he told them to find out for him, was enraged and sent and killed all of the male babies two years old and under. He, he added the, the two years just to be safe so that he would eliminate any potential... Um, whatever you would call it, competitors. His sons were in line to take over the throne. Um, he was a wicked, evil, lousy person and king. Five days before he died, he executed three of his sons that were in line for um, the throne. He was a nice guy. <clears throat> the story of how he died which I'm not going to go into. It's gory. Um, it's almost unbelievable. And he had it coming. So um, he, was, he died in horrible agony. And he deserved it. But anyway, on that happy note, we'll move on. There are three things, three illustrations from this visit and these men that we can, I think, glean as a message to us. First of all, we are to, we're to seek. We're to seek God. That isn't new to the Bible. Everywhere, the Bible calls us to seek. Now, here's what God does. God gives us the inclination, he arouses and awakens in our hearts the hunger for God. So he produces that. Then he turns around and gives us the ability to seek. He sends 
believers across our path. He knows how to intersect our lives with people that know Him. All of this, God creates first. He awakens the desire in my heart. But I am to respond to it by seeking. I'm to respond to it by recognizing the value of God and going after Him, seeking Him, reading His Word, attending church, seeking God, finding out what I can find out. They sought. And I want you to notice what we have here. First of all, there was perception. They perceived. Part of seeking is three things. Perceive, prioritize, persist. Seeking involves those three things. One, they saw his star. They perceived something of tremendous value. They believed this is a sign of the birth of the Messiah. Where would, and by the way, where would they have gotten that? Well, you can go clear back into the Old Testament to uh, another semi-lousy guy by the name of Balaam. And he was a false prophet, really, into whose mouth, however, God put truth. And he, as Moses, was ready to lead or bring Israel to the borders of the Promised Land. He, Balaam, prophesied, he said, a star will arise out of Jacob and a, a king will come from them. It's possible that this is one of the little pieces of Scripture evidence that the wise men seized on, <clears throat> but they recognized something of tremendous value. They perceived. It's a wonderful day when God helps us to perceive, I'm on the wrong search and I need to get on a different search. I need to find God. I need God. That's, a, that's the best dawning of light we can ever experience. They perceived. Second, <clears throat> they prioritized. What do I mean by that? Well, we don't know again for sure. But if they're from the area that <clears throat> people think they were from, they had a journey of four or five months. They left their whatever affairs they had, they set them in order. Whatever obligations they had, they got someone to substitute for them. They left. And they went on a four or five month journey journey leaving their responsibilities because they recognize the value of this now hear me i i i will get my opportunities for drive-by shootings and here's one that comes to my mind the only thing that we will spend four or five months traveling and laying aside all of our responsibilities including those at church is for um, Billy Sue's um, competition of baton twirling. You understand what I mean? And Billy, Billy Sue and Daisy May, they made the finals, and the finals are in Johannesburg, South Africa this year, and so we're going, and so we can't help, we can't be here, we can't do anything. That's my chance to get that dig in again. That's about the only thing we'll sacrifice for. And I'm not going to take a poll afterwards to see whether you like that or not. We're setting a value. These men put a value. They said, this is worth more than all that. We do that with other things too. They prioritized all these things that are our obligations and they're good things and so they don't matter as much as this. And then they kept at it. They persisted. This, at the end of this journey, they still 
we're unsure where to go, what to do. Where, where is this person that we're looking for? And so they go to come into Jerusalem, which made sense. They come to the capital, and they are asking, and we don't know how many and who, but they begin asking, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? They kept at it. Where is he? This is part of seeking God until I know I find him. Whatever obstacles, there was a young couple in Oregon, and I, they were, let's see, I think Liz and I were probably 20, maybe 23. Um, I was in seminary and pastoring, and this young couple our age um, came to church, and they were coming, uh, they'd been coming no more four or five Sundays maybe. And I just knew God was after them. <clears throat> and I began to see obstacles come up in their pathway. Um, dumb stuff. Even weird, just weird things that kept them from church. Um, Unusual get called into work for some emergency so they couldn't be there. And I'm not saying that the, the devil sits around man, you know, manipulating your whole company so that you don't go to church. But I know there's a devil. I know he works. And it was the second or third Sunday that they hadn't been there. And <clears throat> they said, they called me and uh, Sunday morning. And they said, we were going to be there. Um, and... We got up this morning, we have no idea, but a battery was dead. So we can't make it. Well, I was in Oregon City, which is on the south end of the Portland metropolitan area. They were clear up in northeast Portland. And, <clears throat> you know, I just believe, as soon as I got off the phone, I thought, you know what, this is the devil. Now, I don't know this devil goes around unhooking battery cable, uh, cables. But something happened, and I figured, I'm not going to... I'm going to work on this. So I grabbed a college kid and I said, listen, um, take your rattle trap car, go clear out to this house, gave him the address, and pick them up, bring them to church. And it was about an hour to church. And so I called them and I said, I, gotta, I named the kid, which probably sent them to their knees immediately. But I named the kid and I said, hey, I'm sending Paul out there to get you um, because you need to be here. <clears throat> they came. If I recall, it was that Sunday that they came forward in the invitation, knelt at the altar, and found God. There will be obstacles to our search for God. There is a war going on over our eternal souls. Satan works hard. God works harder and is bigger and stronger. But those obstacles, if we let them, can keep us from our search. Where is he? They persisted. <clears throat> now the second thing that we're to do, we're to seek... We're to submit. I want you to notice here, <clears throat> when they found the place, <clears throat> they went their way, in verse 9, the star brought them over the very place where Jesus was. They rejoiced. And in 11, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, when they saw the child, that's the first thing I want us to notice. That is acknowledgement. They acknowledged that's him. They recognized what we have been hoping for, what in our faraway land, we saw a star, we planned this trip, this this was the object of our, all of our efforts. They saw him. They acknowledged, this is, what we, this is who we've been seeking for. Second, they abandoned. 
they abandoned their own agenda, they abandoned their own authority, they abandoned their own ambitions, because we see, you know what this, the wording here, they fell, it says they fell on the ground before him. Literally, it means to be prone, fully stretched out on the ground, with your face to the ground, your forehead touching the ground. It is a position of supreme submission and acknowledgement and recognition to a master. The, some of the wording literally means to behave like a dog. That's what it means. Like a dog not cowering necessarily from terror, but a dog to his master. That's what it means. That's supposed to be, you know, that's why when we pray, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's what that's what God says we start out to pray. That's the attitude I'm to have. Hallowed be thy name. I'm not in charge here. I'm not coming into God's presence to inform him of what he needs to do and let him know that this is how he needs to handle things. And I'm not real happy with this and I want this to change. And I need that. That won't get me anywhere. Remember, who are these people? These people are not, they're upper caste. These people are not um, untouchables as we have in some cultures. These are prominent men in their own country. They're surely very well to do. They commanded who knows how many servants. But it, and, and I know they weren't alone. They had to have an entourage and they had a convoy of camels and so forth. There were servants surely standing around watching them. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. They fell on their faces. That's my obligation to abandon my, my very life. The so-called rights I believe I have, I am to let them go. I'm not my own, Lord you own me. You do with me what you wish. Have we done that? You ever done that? That's a crossroad you'll remember. That isn't some minor little, you know, Lord, bless the food, and, you know, thank you for the grilled cheese sandwiches, you know, by the way, I abandoned myself to you. No. This is, this is, a why in the road where when we recognize who God is, we acknowledge Him, we have sought, and we find, we know, then we go down our face. I'm obligated to do that. They abandoned themselves, themselves bowed down, and then you have this little phrase that says they worshipped him they worshipped him they not only got on their faces but they gave honor and in the, in the just in even the very posture they took they aligned what does worship really mean is to it's to attribute honor and worth to this god that we are bowing before and a hard, a, a, a core heart issue of worship is the third thing, to align with Him. God's not obligated to line up with me. I am supposed to line up with Him. And I don't know if any of you, I'm not going to get off into car mechanics, but if any of you have ever had to have a front-end alignment done, <clears throat> We have better equipment nowadays than when I first started driving. But your, your car can be out of alignment. The front suspension and so forth. 
it tears up your tires. It's not, it's not good. And so if we're careful in maintaining things, periodically you go in and you have the alignment checked. God does that with us. We, we need to always be prepared for God's alignment shop. Now here's the thing about God and His alignment shop. Um, Big O or whoever here in town, they can't do one thing to align the, my vehicle unless I make an appointment. I take the initiative and I make an appointment and I drive it down there and I drop it off and I, you know, I, I let them do this. I've taken the initiative. The difference with God's alignment shop is He didn't ask for an appointment. You understand? When He knows, uh, I'm a little off. My attitude's not what it ought to be. I'm sloughing off a bit here. I am getting a little bit into my own agenda. There there comes, it doesn't matter if it's day or night, there comes that tap on the shoulder, listen, better change your alignment. That's the core. If I'm a worshiper, I am open to the Holy Spirit checking my heart and telling me, you know what? Don't pray like that. Don't get demanding of me. Um, Stifle that attitude or whatever it might be. Talk to me. That's God's alignment. He keeps me in a line with His heart, with His will, with His nature, with, with His attitude towards sin and heaven and hell and walking with God. So they align themselves with him by worshiping him. Finally, the three gifts that they gave. That service. We're to seek, we're to submit, we're to serve. Now what does, in what sense do we serve? Well, one, the gold that they gave. Possessions of that sort are, in a sense, um, there are life's abilities and energies turned into a, a substance, um, a, some form of currency. Um, God says, I want you to, I require of you. He says, you give me mine. You, you give me the tithe. You offer to me the gifts that represent your life's work and ability, the abilities I gave you. Moses told the Israelites, he said, it's only because God gave you the power to earn wealth. The very, well, I'm I'm a self-made man. No, nobody's a self-made man. Except some people that you can look at that are an absolute and total incredible wreck. Yeah? They're self-made. But God's the one that gives me the ability, the know-how, the capacity to live and to earn. And he said, now you, you, you honor me with that. So the gold that they gave to them, to them that is, represents their, their life's work. Second, I'm to pray. Prayer is involved. Frankincense was offered in the composition of the incense that they burned continually in the temple. Frankincense was part of that incense. The the cloud of incense when they burned it, which was representative of the prayers of the saints. You see that all through the scripture, clear into the book of Revelation. Prayer is, you know, really prayer. The devil will do a lot to set obstacles in your path to become a good prayer. 
and you, you become a good prayer by reading books on prayer. No. You become a good prayer by praying. By praying. By doing it. And part of it, key to it, is the heart attitude with which I do it. Prayer is not getting God to come around to my way of thinking. Prayer is discerning through submission in prayer to the Holy Spirit who helps me come around to His way of thinking. That's what prayer is. Romans says we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit helps us to pray. He tells us, pray for this. He prompts our hearts. We sense it. Now, not every single day when we pray. There are times when it seems even maybe dry. And we do what David said in the Psalms. He said, I set my prayer in order before you. And he had a prayer list, in other words. And he, and he had to open his eyes when he was praying. When we were little kids, we would always, there were five of us, and we were always deeply concerned with the spiritual welfare of each other. And so we would be sure to open one eye and see who was opening their eyes during prayer so we could, with great somberness, kind of like the Democrats, with great sadness report to our parents, Dad, uh, Mary was looking around during the prayer. Just, you know, it's just concern for her soul. I am to pray in some senses, in an organized way. That's why Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer. I don't have to pray the exact words, but it's a pattern for prayer. Frankincense was burned on the altar then. So this gift it represents the service for us of praying. Finally, practice. There is the daily practice of being a Christian. Myrrh was a an in, chief ingredient. It's another spice. It's a, um, an incense. And myrrh was in the composition of the perfume, basically. The oil-based perfume that the priests had sprinkled on them, and it was sprinkled on every piece of furniture, throughout the temple so that there was the perfume of serving God. There is, God intends our lives, our interactions with people, our, you know, our greetings of people through the day. As we encounter others, what kind of perfume lingers where after we've been in a conversation or whatever. What kind of aroma do we leave? You understand what I mean? That represents the daily practice in the world. God didn't make us to be monks. He expects us to be mingling with people and be a representative for Jesus. And often, we don't have to say anything. I had an opportunity, well, I don't even know what I had yesterday. A bit of an opportunity, but there's a person that I met here a few times, <clears throat> far, far, far away from God. Um, <clears throat> and once in a while, just cross paths with this person. Um, barely know him, uh, but he knows who I am. I mean, I've, I've introduced myself, and he's been introduced to me, and he knows I pastor here. Um, I don't know that he's ever darkened a uh, door of a church in his entire life. But I prayed here a week or so ago after an encounter with him. Um, Lord, somehow help me um, just to keep bumping into him. Um, and yesterday, um, yesterday I was at Baumgar's buying Liz an impact drill. 
she needs one. That I can borrow it. Um, and this guy went by the end of an aisle, saw me, stopped, came back around. We didn't say anything about God. But he knows who I am. He knows I'm a preacher. And he's on the other end of the scale. But I just figured, okay, God, I, one of these days, um, hopefully, the fragrance of our conversations will have some effect. You're the same way. Don't fall into the accusation that unless you grab somebody, kind of force them to their knees, pray some sinner's prayer with them. Listen, God's better at getting people to that point where they finally go on their knees. Let Him do that through us, mostly just by having something about our lives that makes them want the same thing. Does that make sense? I think myrrh represents the fragrance of a life of just living for Jesus. We're going to close with a carol that we're familiar with. What child is this? And some of the words of that, and this, it's a question, really, that these wise men answered. That the carol asked, what child is this? Who is this? We have to answer that same question. What child is this? this who is he and what do i owe him and what is he to be in my life and in my heart let's bow our heads and we will pray and then we'll stand and sing some of the verses of this carol father in heaven i pray that something from this illustration from thousands of years ago, which can be and must be patterned today. I pray that we would look at ourselves. Have we ever, in our hearts, gone down on our faces before you and said, you, you are God, you own me, I don't own myself. Take and use my life as you see fit. I pray that you would help us with your aid to examine our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. While we stand and